Welcome to Headlines. This is David Lichtenstein. This is the Yeshiva Shalmaila, an hour of Halacha and Hashkafa. You know, we got a lot of responses to last week's program, on both sides of the issues. And if you go to our website, which is headlinestorah.com, you will see that after the Mara Makaimis, we actually put up all the emails and the voicemails that we receive for you to listen to. Many of them agree. Many of them, as you can imagine, don't agree. I celebrate them both. Uh, and I invite you. So don't think I'm not replaying those emails because, or voicemails, rather, because they're not worthwhile or special. They are. Uh, we just don't have that much time, but we do put them up on the website. This week's topic will be mental health and halacha. We will have a few weeks on it. We will have some fantastic rabbanim. We will have a guy in Reb David Kohn. We will have a guy in Reb Herschel Shechta uh, speaking about, you know, what do you listen to, Das Tyra or the therapist? We have the honor of having Rep. Sandy Orenstein, really one of the tzaddikim of our generation. They do 80,000 referrals to mental health. He runs a relief, and he will be speaking about it. And he will also be speaking about the stigma of mental health in our community and how it's receding, how it's declining. Here's a piece of that clip. You, you do, we said, 80,000 calls a year. Do you get a lot of calls from Rabbanim, Rosh Hashivas, community leaders who find themselves um, struggling with a trauma that they need help with and have the courage to reach out and say, um, I need help with a trauma. Can you recommend somebody, either me or one of my children? Yes. Very many. We will have Rabbi Dr. David Fox, who's both a, a world-acclaimed uh, psychologist, as well as a musmach from a number of G'dayli Hadoyer, and he was speaking about the halachas of Yichud with a therapist, Lashon Hara in therapy. Can you say Lashon Hara? You know the story, there were a few uh, Jewish old women together, and they were talking about their sons. So one said, my son, every year of Shabbos, he sends me the most beautiful bouquet of flowers. And the other one says, my son, he visits me every Sunday with all his children. And the third one says, no, no, my son is more special. My son, he spends an hour a week and he pays somebody $500 just to talk about his mother. Isn't that amazing? So we will be speaking about Lush and Hara in therapy. We will have the therapist, Shoshana ben Alil, one of Lakewood's great therapists. She will talk and be speaking about mental health in Shaduchim, um, as well as many other topics. So we have some really fascinating um, guest this week on a very interesting topic. The next few weeks we have some interesting topics coming up. We, we're going to be speaking about Mesira in Halacha. There's this case going on now in New York that's causing, unfortunately, a tremendous chil Hashem. We'll be speaking about Mesira in Halacha. We will also be speaking about in future weeks donating organs. What's the, you know, the great Machlekes, Ramesh, and other G'daylum about this. And then we will also be speaking about one of these weeks, are you Responsible for your spouse's Yerush Your husband just doesn't want to go to shul in the morning. How much of a fuss do you have to make? Or you have one chumra, she doesn't have that chumra, she's reading a book you don't want, he's reading a book you don't want. How responsible are we to our spouse's Yerush These are upcoming topics. If you have any other topics you find interesting, leave a message either by email or by voicemail, and we'll be glad to uh, do it if it's the public interest, we think that there's a real interest in it. So, I just want to, our numbers, U.S. 732-806-8700, Eretz Yisrael, 02-372-0304, in England, we got a lot of calls from England, 330-117-0250, you can find all our programs at headlinestorah.com, they're also on Yeshiva World News, and you can also get the app, it's either for the iPhone or the Samsung, Headlines Radio Show. Before we go to our program, I want to speak about a mental health issue in this week's Parsha, and I think it's relevant to anybody who's a parent. You know, I have a question. We have Avram. Avram, Olam Chesed Yibana, right? He was the kindest. When you think of Avram, you think of altruism, mercy, a bleeding heart. L'Rayim V'Latayvim. He's davening for the people of Sedaim, opening up his house to every errant Arab who's passing by. Avram, you think of soup kitchens, uh, to, to the co-religionists, non-co-religionists, benevolent, charitable, kind, open, Avram, endless energy. 
Who Yoshev Pesach Oil Gechay Mayim? This speaks Parsha. The Gemara in Ksuba says Klal Yisrael is called Goyim Lechasadim Bnei Goyim Lechasadim Hamarzikim Bevrisay Shal Avram Avinu. Avram is loving kindness. Avram has a son, Yishmael, and what is Yishmael? Yadai Bakoil, grabbing everything from everybody. Biyad Kolboy. What went wrong? And it's not only that. What do we know about Yishmael? Yishmael is similar to Avram. In other words, Avram has no boundaries. Chesed means I give to somebody who's totally not worthy. He's going to be the epitome, the antithesis of everything that Avram is this time. It's a one-time event in creation. It's 180 degrees, the opposite of Avram's belief. He goes to Davin for them. Because Chesed really doesn't have rules. At least in its, in its purest form, Chesed is for the, the unworthy Yes, you failed, and I'm going to do you a favor. You, Chesed is about going beyond what somebody otherwise is then, if I give you a... Look at his son, Yishmael. He also has no boundaries. What is Yishmael? It says that when it came to Martin Tyre, they said, Leisigne, we don't want, we want other people's properties. Um, Znus, also Yishmael. What is, what is the difference between Avram and Yishmael when you think of it? They both have no boundaries. Chesed is when I have no boundaries and therefore I extend myself without boundaries to help others. And the opposite of chesed, which is taiva, is I also have no boundaries. But everything else, a narcissist, everything belongs to me. I, I take what's not mine. I'm a zana in what's not mine. It's also without boundaries. One is for myself and one is for others. What went wrong here? Something. And we... We've all met Yishmael's and Avram's in our life. I've met many Avram's, Sandy Ornstein, certainly an Avram, a man who spends his entire life, we reef, renewal, nobody's impacted more lives. The people from the big Chalem houses, from these health organizations, Taim Cheshab, there's so many Avram's that each of us know, people who go beyond what's expected. We also know a lot of narcissists, people who, all they are is oisnutzes, they're users, they take what's not theirs, they don't contribute, also no boundaries. Why are some people Avram and some people Yishmael? And how do we want to create our children or in ourselves that we should be Avram and not Chas Vishalm, the narcissistic Yishmael? So let me share with you a thought. What do we know about Hagar, the mother of Yishmael? She gets into this big fight with Sarah. She stops respecting Sarah because she has, she's pregnant and Sarah can't become pregnant. So Sarah, but Vatanea Sarah, what does she do? Sarah makes her life a little miserable. She's strutting around, and she feels, so she, she starts, you know, she, Sarah gets even. What does it say? Does she work out the issue? Does she say, you know what, Let's, let me apologize. Let's work this out. What does it say? Vativrach mi Sarah, she runs. And where does she run in? She runs like a mad woman into the desert. There's no food. It's basically almost like a suicide attempt. She gets insulted. That's it. I can't deal with it. I'm out of here. And what does the Malach tell her? Go back. Shuvi el Go work it out. Suicide isn't the answer. What's the next time we see Hagar? Now she has the child, and her child is teaching Yitzhak all about Avayda Zara. So what does it say? Avram sends her out. And it says, She runs out of water. She throws her son under a tree. And Vatelech, Vateshev Mirachik, she sits far away. How she says, Kim Tavichesh, as far as the shooting why I don't want to see the child die. Well, maybe you can do something. Stop somebody. I, th- I mean it says there was a, a bear Mayim right near that she just couldn't see. So what is her attitude towards challenge? She she gives up. She runs away. She wants she tr- she becomes suicidal. Idol. She throws the child under the thing and she starts crying. Batisa as Kaila Batefk. What does Hugga represent? She's a victim. She's a paralyzed victim. She feels powerless, helpless, for weak. She has no self esteem. Think of it. Avram is confident. He's fighting wars when he's a hundred, when he's he's fighting wars with kings. He's Bayikra Bashem Hashem, he's opening Yeshivas. All over He's, he's challenging. He's davening for Saddam. He's inviting in people. Hagar, exact opposite. Right? And Hagar is his, his concubine, is his mate. She's helpless, defeated. Um, 
uh, paralyzed. She's a real victim. No self-esteem whatsoever. Now look at her son, Yishmael. He grows up with a mother. Who? What's the mother telling him? You're not going to succeed. We can't succeed. We're helpless. When the challenge comes, you sit back and you die. You cry. So think of it. Two children. One child has self-esteem. You can. You could do. When you can do, you can give. All chesed means I'm giving something of mine. I'm giving my time. I'm giving my money. It's something I'm giving away from something that really my survival could be contingent on it. Remember, in the olden days, 80% of a person's time was spent gathering food. Right? Just the malachas the, hapas, the, the malachas hapas, right? Today it's 3% of the population. But to be a Baal Chesed, we have to feel good about ourselves. We have to feel that we could expand. Think of somebody who's feeling good. They sit with their shoulders back. They, they're spread out. When somebody's fearful, they huddle in. What does the Gemara call it? A tefach seichek. A laughing tefach is when the fingers are spread apart. Tefach atzuvais is when they're clenched together. They're tight. So you have a child. He grows up with a mother who says, I'm helpless. I can't do. I'm paralyzed. I'm forlorn. I'm feeble. I'm weak. And the child hears, I'm weak. I'm weak. I can't survive. When somebody feels great, they can give. When they have a moon or they have confidence, they can give. When somebody feels like a victim, they have to grab everything. It's all about survival. It becomes narcissism. Yade bakoil. Take everything you can get. You can't give anything. You have, you're in a constant fight for survival. You should grow up in the house of Ram. He was much wealthy as a child than Avram ever was. He grew up in one of the wealthy houses, but he always felt like a victim. So what's the biggest gift we can give our child or ourselves? The gift of Avram, the gift of self-esteem, the gift of confidence, the gift of like Reb Tzadik writes, just like a person has to believe in Hashem, he has to believe in himself. That's the gift the parent can give, the gift we can give ourselves. What's the worst thing we can give ourselves? What Hagar gives Ishmael. Victimization, helplessness, powerlessness. And what does ultimately it mean? Narcissism. Mental health in this week's Parsha. If you agree with me, L'chaim. And if you don't, I'm sure I'll hear from you. Let's go to our wonderful guests. We have on the phone with us from New York, Rabbi Sandy Orenstein, who is the president and founder of Relief an organization that gives referrals on mental health professionals. Instead of me putting words in his mouth, we'll let him tell us what it does. Welcome, Rabbi Orenstein. Hello, David. How are you? Baruch Hashem. Tell us, what does Relief do? So Relief is a medical referral service um, specifically for mental health issues. We have a database of many thousands of uh, clinicians, psychiatrists, psychologists, and um, hospitals and other centers, and people call us when they have a mental health issue, and we refer them to the um, uh, to the right professional. Now, h- how many people do you have on staff to to, to facilitate this? We have over 20 people on staff um, out of eight offices in four countries. And how many referrals do you make a year? So we currently field over 350 phone calls a day. We log into our computer system between seven and 8,000 new patients a year. But we speak to many, many thousands more from the old patients that call for follow-up with us. Um, Relief started over 15 years ago, and we currently have in our system logged in over 83,000 patients, not calls, patients. How many did you say? 83,000. Wow. So considering that the Orthodox population in America is, I don't know, what would you say, 750,000? You're saying that more than 10% you've worked with. Definitely. So, um, and 350 phone calls a day is something to the effect of uh, 80,000 a year on that basis. Is that fair to say? That's right. So, um, how common are mental health issues? Like, you've been doing this for a long time. Like, you know, it used to be in the Zman HaGemara, and I think this is one of the reasons why people consider it such a taboo, is that there was a concept of a cherish shait of a cotton, none of which were good. I guess a cotton was okay, but a cherish and shait weren't. Um, would you say that um, uh, uh, somebody who's going for mental health, like, 
what, do we have an outbreak of shaitan? Like, what's going on here? Explain it to me. Absolutely not. <clears throat> the shaitan do not call for help. It's only the healthy people that call for help. A very small percentage of the callers are what we call today crazy people, maybe 2%. 98% of the people that call us are very healthy people. They were just hit with a crisis or a trauma or anything else that that showed up and there was something they were never confronted with, and they're the ones who are calling for help. Can you, Rabbi Orenstein, give us an example of common traumas that would cause people to reach out for help? So it has to be divided in two. There are biological mental disorders. People can be suffering from anxiety, um, depression, uh, OCD, or any other disorder, just biological, with no um, um, explained trauma attached to it. And then trauma can be any crisis that hits a family, whether it's a, um, a loss of a family member, whether it's a um, um, financial loss, whether it's a past abuse, domestic violence, um, molestation, and on and on. So would, would, would having to deal with, let's say, somebody in the family getting sick, would that be a trauma that could cause this? Definitely so. What about stress at school? Could that cause this? Stress at school, stress at work, um, peer pressure. Um, peer pressure like, meaning define peer pressure. Peer pressure would be a, a bochern yeshiva, a girl in seminary, a bochern a girl in shaduchim, um, um, people living in the neighborhood. Today, peer pressure is all over the place. Um, and no one is immune to it. When you say no one, define no one. Like 10% aren't immune, 20 or do you mean 100% aren't immune to it? I would say 75%. Of us are not immune to peer pressure. Right. And what's the toll peer pressure takes on people? Usually it, uh, uh, it causes a tremendous anxiety. Um, and many times it causes depression. Um, and in many cases it just causes a person's very low self-esteem to... Um, to, to, to come out to the surface, um, and people are not equipped to deal with it themselves. So, Rabbi Orenstein, is it fair to say that just about every healthy person will at times in their life need the help of a mental professional to get past dif- some difficult situation they're encountering? I have no proof of that. Is it fair to say possible? But I usually look at, uh, we usually look at studies, and I don't know if there's any study that show that every healthy person sometime in their life would uh, have to reach out to a mental health profession. Rabbi Orenstein, would you say that people who reach out to healthy people, which is the majority of people who reach out to healthy, to health professionals, end up with um, basically it, it helps them overcome this hurdle and they live healthier happier and more productive lives? Definitely, with the condition that they go to the right mental health professional. Because many right, so people... let's, let's go, let's go. I, want to get, I want to get to that second, to the second part, who's the right. But, but I want to go back to this. Would you say that people who go to health, mental health professionals, who's the right one, right, we'll assume it's the right one, end up leading happier, healthier more successful, more productive lives in whatever field it could be. It could be learning, it could be chinuch, it could be kail, it could be uh, business, it could be marriage. Would you say that overall it, 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 it's, it, it helps people clear the cobwebs, the pain, the, the hurt, the trauma out of their lives? It's a hard question to answer. As I said before, I have no proof of that because 90% or maybe 100% of the people that call us I usually in a crisis. I usually have issues. So I've never dealt with people who have perfectly normal, healthy lives and just want to go for help um, to better their lives. So I've never dealt with that before. So I have no opinion on it. So the people that you have dealt with who are healthy people, let's talk about the healthier ones, not somebody who has severe, you know, you know, institutional type of issues, but the mostly the majority of them, you say 98% are healthy, after they're finished, do they come out sort of in a, in a better mindset post-using relief? A very large percentage. We couldn't, uh, we don't claim a 100% success rate. That's almost impossible. But a very large percentage of people that went for help definitely come out better 
some much better, some get healed, and some not. So, um, but uh, they definitely get sometimes the medication and many times the tools they need to deal with this issue if it ever comes up again. Okay, now let's talk about the right health professional. There seems to be some idea of ours in our community that an unlicensed person can be a health professional. So, like, take me. I think I'm a pretty smart guy. I mean, I you know, I get along with people. So, would I be able to be a health professional? And if somebody comes and they're suffering with uh, anxiety, depression, loss, trauma, and they say, you know, David, uh, we decide we want to save some money. Would you? Can you be our therapist? What would you say to that? I say, David, you would be the perfect um, mental health professional if you go to school and you train and you um, get supervision, and you do a very good internship. The problem with the non-licensed professionals are, and we don't refer to non-licensed professionals, because a licensed professional at minimum did the schooling and got a supervision, and, and, and many of them have continued supervision as they go into private practice, whereas a non-licensed professional um, learned everything on his own. He works alone. Um, he's not really accountable to anyone. He's not accountable to his license. And he doesn't have a reputation to uphold. So our policy in relief is that we only send to licensed professionals. Not to say that many Rabbanim and many non-licensed must probably have certain expertise in certain areas, but that's not what we do. Would you equate, uh, Rabbi Orenstein, somebody going to an unlicensed health professional, if I were to do it like me, I don't, but and saying it would be the equivalent of asking a Shiloh of somebody who never got smicha or going to, you know, a, a chiropractor who never got a degree or, a, could you imagine, an acupuncturist, <laughs> this sounds dangerous, or God forbid even worse, imagine going to a cancer specialist who never went to medical school. Would you equate that, somebody going to an unlicensed person to the above? Um, the first most really gave us a good one is asking a Shiloh from a very big time at Chochem, but who never got smicha, who never got shimush, and just paskening shayles. Let's cut over to an interview with Hagoyin or Parashal Shechta, the Rosh Hashiva, Rabbi Yitzchik al He's going to talk about Das Torah and therapy. Do you listen to a therapist? Do you listen to Das, das Torah? A conflict between a therapist and your Rav? Let's hear what he has to say about that. So, today, Das Torah is a very frequently used um, word on everything. It's das taira, it's das taira. So, can, uh, and it's used sort of like it's absolute. And my question is, can das taira make a mistake? Can a rav make a mistake? He says a hashkafa psak or a, you know, a opinion about something. Is das taira sort of immutable or is, could, it, could it be wrong? No, immutability, that's only by the Catholics. They believe that the Pope is, uh, can never make a mistake. By us, we can Conceive. We have Parsha and the Chumash of Paralam Dovashel Tzibur, where Halacha can imagine the entire Bezna Godel making a mistake. All 71 members give the wrong psak. And the Reva Tzibur follows them. The whole thing only applies if it was a unanimous vote. So we have such a possibility on our books. I don't know if it ever happened. There was, I don't know if there ever was historically a Paralam Dovashel Tzibur. But uh, we, can, uh, we can imagine such a thing. It's not immutable. Look, uh, an opinion about Hashkaf is also halacha. There's halacha how, what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do. There's halacha what you're allowed to think, you're not allowed to think. So Hashkaf is also halacha. But uh, no no human being is uh, is uh, is beyond making a mistake. Everyone can make a mistake. Moshe yeah. Abedin made a mistake. So if, 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 if the Rav says something that's... Um... You see, it's not an area where he has expertise. There was a, where I live, uh, there was a fellow. He he opened up a, a restaurant, and it was doing very badly. And I said, why did you open in that location? He said, my Rebbe told me to open in that location. Is, is Das Tyre extend to areas where, I mean, to, to, where to open up a, a restaurant is not necessarily a Rebbe's field of expertise. So where does Das Tyre extend to? Where doesn't it extend to? Where, where do you say, wait, it, it, that's not what Das Tyre is meant to be used for? How would the Rav be magnet? 
Das Torah applies to opening a restaurant also, but it, it applies in the same way if you have a shayla and a chicken. So the Rav can't pass on the shayla long distance. He has to look at the broken leg to see if it's a trefa. You can't pass on a mara, whether it's a mara toh or a mara tome, unless you look at it. You can't pass on uh, by the telephone. You have to see the mara. So here also, you have to understand business, you have to understand restaurants, you have to understand neighborhoods. Yeah. Same thing, shiduchim. You ask uh, the Rebbe, you should have married this girl. That's a shayla halacha, whether you should marry the girl. So if the Rebbe would know the Talmud very well and know the girl very well, that would be a shana halacha. The thing is that uh, usually the Rabbanim don't know the Talmudim that well. It'll take a year till he figures out all the details of the Talmud and all the details of the girl to decide whether they're for each other. So the Dastur, in theory, does apply to opening restaurants, but the Rebbe has to be uh, bakant in, in, in your restaurants and in your business and in your neighborhoods, which is usually not the case. He can't pass it on the chicken either if he, if he doesn't look at the chicken, if he doesn't know Yeridea. It's not like a, uh, an oracle by the Greek of the Abed Zohar. They used to have oracles. So that was a late sonist. That a Dastar is not an oracle. Dastar means a Tamachachem, who knows Kola Terakula. So even though there are certain cases which are not discussed by the Aloha, it's like a jigsaw puzzle that has a thousand pieces. So if you have 997 pieces, and what the missing three pieces are. You can figure it out. But if you're missing 500 pieces, how are you going to figure out? If you have 500, how can you figure out what the other 500 are? That story applies to business also. But it's only if the Tamachach who is asked has a strong knowledge in the area. So Otherwise, the same he really shouldn't express, he shouldn't really express his opinion. So the same thing with the Rav say extends to, let's say, you have a uh, a therapist who knows the, uh, the, a child well says, take the kid out of this school. And, and uh, the Manal or Rashiva says, no, I think the kid should stay in school. Would you say to stand the same thing, that if the therapist has an expertise in this area, would you listen to the therapist? I would think so, unless the Manal also has such a strong uh, idea in, in uh, psychology and so on. Yeah, about that. Look, he listened to the Mumchim in every field. Now, I would like to ask Rashiva, is there a Makoyer for the concept of Das Taira besides the, the Chinuch? Is there any Makoyer for it in, in Halacha? When Rishonim and Achreinim? Pre, pre the last hundred... I, did, I have the Eitzra Chachma. I did like a search on it. Before yeah. the last hundred years, the word Das Taira is not brought down in that capacity in any of the Nazim, uh It's not down in Bavli, Yerushalmi, Mishnayis, Tanoim, Amaroim, Rabbanin Savroi, Rabbanin uh, Kamoi, Rabbanin Savroi, Rishayinim and Achrayinim until the last mm-hmm. hundred years. What is yeah. the, the Makar for it? The Gemara in Chulin, Per Giranosha, quotes the opinion, one time of the Giranosha is only in Oyeg B'yimin, not B'smol, only in one leg, not the other one. So the Gemara wants to know, is it Das Torah, is it Das Noita? So Das Noita means Aswar, and Das Torah means Akzeris Akosuf. In the terminology in the Gemara, das term means you learn it out from a person. In uh, recent times, it means something that there's no beferish and makkah for. But it's also the Ramor writes in Yeridei, in Hilchus Hayroah Sisa Veheter, that a Chacham has a right to paskin even l'hokil on a Syria Shaila, based on a slight netia sadas. If he knows all the halachas, and he, and he has a Shaila where there's no beferish a chlorkite, as a slight and tiyas adas lahokil lachme is uh, simple. We just say sofik sofik yisur lachumer. But even lahokil, you can paskin lekula big tamachong paskin based on a slight and tiyas adas, because it's like the jigsaw puzzle. He has nine hundred ninety-seven pieces, ninety-seven pieces, and he's missing three pieces. He doesn't know what the din is. So he has a slight and tiyas adas. So all these shalos, they're also shalos and halacha. Hashkaf is also halacha. Whom you should marry is a question of halacha. If the girl is not for you, it's going to be terrible. And what job you should have, what field you should go into, where you should live, and so on. Every, everything is a shayla in halacha. But uh, you, you can only pass on the shayla if you have an idea of the, what the facts are. You have a strong idea of the facts. And you have a strong idea of what halacha is. So if you have the 997 pieces, missing three pieces. So if you have a, a netia sadas, that's called cool. Dastair. There is such a thing, but just to, to pontificate, to say, uh, with that, a lot of people express Dastair. They can't pass Kanashal and Hilchus Kasha. They can't pass Kanashal and Hilchus Shabbos. That they don't know. 
They only know Hashkafe. That's the ridiculous. Hashkafe is also Aloche. Rav Soledesh used to say, people make a mistake, they say the Gemara is divided into two parts, Aloche and Agode. He said, Aloche is what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do, what you have to do. And Hashkafe is what you're allowed to think, what you're not allowed to think, what you're mukhiv to think. It's also Aloche. It's uh, like Chavis al like Rav Hutton Zohan He writes about Chavis al This. The, these are dinim. You have to think like this, and you're not allowed to think like that. It's also halacha. But the das teret, just like a tamachachem can make a mistake sometimes in psak he can make a mistake in das teret as well. But the das teret, no, you should ask one who who is bahavent in halacha. He knows how to come to a hachra. Not always be machma. Not always be mekel. Sometimes you have to be machma. Sometimes mekel. You have to understand to give a das teret. You have to understand all the details of the case. And all the ramifications of the case, you have to tuza harayin very deeply into the whole story. You can't just give from the top of your head a das That's They make it into a joke now. The whole the idea of das became a big joke. Well, thank you very much for your time, and it's uh, an honor to have you with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. How about slacha? A good year. A good year. Now let's go back to our interview with Rabbi Orenstein. Now, let me ask you another question, Rabbi Orenstein. I know when I started out in business, to me, when we needed like insurance for something, I would ask, does anybody know somebody in insurance? And somebody would say, yeah, you know, Mechel's first cousin is insurance. And I would say, good, he's hired. <laughs> but when you get a little older and you're doing this for a lot of years, you say, wait, it's good Mechel, but I think we should do an RFP, in- interview, you know, five or six different insurance brokers, see, you know, are they really good? You spend an hour interviewing them. What's your experience? Who have you done? What's your specialty? What's your schooling? What's your training? What's your policy about insurance? Etc. And then after an extensive interview process, and trust me, they're often extensive, we'll decide which insurance. Or for that matter, when you hire somebody, it used to be, we need a Rebbe for the sixth grader, somebody who's brand new, and she say, well, my cousin happens to be looking for a job. Very likely that's the worst person to hire. You interview 20 Rabbeim, what your particular children of this school, they could be Heimish background, they could be modern, they could be yeshivish. What is our needs? What is his character? What is his personality? I have two or three people interview him. and say, Now, a lot of people, they need a therapist. They pick up the phone. They say, I heard so-and-so has a friend who's a therapist. Good, let's start using him. Do you think that people have to click with their therapist and a thorough vetting and interview process should be done before people pick somebody who is that important in their lives? So I definitely think so, because what you explained before is exactly what Relief does. So Relief has interviewed so far um, close to 1,900 mental health clinicians. Um, We meet them in person, because unlike a cardiologist or oncologist, it's important to know the character of the person, and we get to know what their licenses are, what they specialize in, the type of person they are, what type of therapy they do, and finance, how much they charge, what insurance they take, who is their supervisor, who is their, in their peer supervision group, et cetera, et cetera. And then we do a lot of extensive research on all the clinicians. In addition to that, besides the referrals that we do, we also follow up with our patients. So we do hundreds of thousands of follow-up phone calls, and all this data goes into a system. So we get feedback on all the clinicians. Um, when we do the follow-up phone, because it serves two purposes. A, it's a support for the patient, that somebody they cares. In many cases, they cannot discuss their issues with their neighbors or friends or even family members. And we're there for them to follow up and see how they're doing, if they need additional help. But B, this is how we get our feedback on the clinicians that they go to, and this helps us for future referrals. I understand that Relief does an outstanding job interviewing. They have a lot of experience, but notwithstanding that, isn't it important for an individual finding a therapist who they have to be comfortable with talking about the most vulnerable parts of this of their existence, and they also have to be comfortable with that this person has the same hashkafa as them, the same ideas. Isn't it notwithstanding that important for somebody to say, no, I have to interview, when the first visit should be, I'm interviewing you. And it, a constant, like, can you really help? Because he could be a great referral. It could be most fantastic boy and most fantastic girl. It's just not for this shidduch. Would you agree with that or not? So we, many times 
advise this to our callers. Some of the callers that are concerned when they call and they ask too many questions. So I tell them, listen, I'm giving you two or three names. Why don't you go call them and have an interview on the phone? You're the, you're the client. You're paying the bill. And many times you go down there, go for one session, see if you click. And sometimes it may take a few sessions to see if you click with a clinician. And then you'll make a decision if you want to continue. Okay. Most people in the from community don't need that. Um, there's Baruch Hashem, a tremendous trust that they placed in relief. And relief tells them based on our experience of what we know about this clinician. And usually they will follow that. So, Rabbi Orenstein, in our community, there's a stigma to going for, towards going to therapy, which um, I, I grew up with. But as I got older, you know, I realized to me it's sort of like going, doing exercise or going to the gym, which most people really dislike. But if you get older, you have to do exercise. But, um, you know, our brains also need exercise. They need health. They need, they need a, you know, they have to work things out. And I think that people who go for therapy, are often come out much healthier and more productive. I could say in my life I've gone through therapy, you know, t- um, traumas on different occasions, mostly business, but, you know, other times. And I have gone, and it's made me, you know, Baruch Hashem, I think, you know, allowed me to be more productive, a lot more productive. Why is there such a stigma attached? Like, people wouldn't have an issue going to a doctor if they had a diagnosis of some disease, but on the other hand, when it comes to if they had a, if they were driving a bicycle and fell off, if they were crossing the street and banged into a pole, they would right away rush to the best doctor. Jews only use the best doctor, of course. Um, why, when it comes to therapy, is there such a stigma, and what can we do about it to um, to relieve it? So the stigma question is a very loaded question. Um, I'm going to address it. Why the stigma? I don't know, but I'll tell you what the callers tell us when they call. Um, <clears throat> A, am I the only one? They can't believe that they're the only one suffering from OCD or the daughter just diagnosed with an eating disorder. So, well, then, we leave the numbers don't lie. We tell this to the callers. We tell the caller that we get 350 phone calls a day just like yours, and we have tens of thousands of patients in our system. You're not the only one. B, the fact that I'm going for help, am I crazy? And once again, what I addressed before, we tell the callers, crazy people don't call. It's the healthy people that call. So the fact that you picked up the phone, and sometimes it took a long time to gather the courage to make that phone call, means that you're a healthy person and you're looking out for yourself. But what's most important is that people look at themselves and feel guilty and perhaps look in the mirror and see a failure if they have to go for help. And what we often tell them is that just because you're a, married or you're a parent or you're a business owner, that does not mean that you know how to solve every problem. It's not even expected of you. Um, If your dishwasher or car would break down, it wouldn't be expected of you just because you're married to know how to fix it. So if you have a psychological malfunction as a result of some crisis or trauma that hit you, or even an unexplained biological anxiety or depression, it's not expected of you to know how to fix it. But there are professionals out there that can help you with it. So why feel guilty? So, Rabbi, Rabbi Orenstein, um, you you do, we said, 80,000 calls a year. Do you get a lot of calls from Rabbanim, Rosh Hashivas, community leaders who find themselves um, struggling with a trauma that they need help with and have the courage to reach out and say, um, I need help with a trauma. Can you recommend somebody, either me or one of my children? Yes. Very many. So it's it's interesting that it seems that even though I'm saying that there's such a stigma, it seems as a community we are becoming more open to it, even among our very leaders. Well, the numbers don't lie, and and in in the the biggest people um, call for help. And obviously, what we tell them is that going for help doesn't show a weakness in you; it shows a strength in you. So the bigger they are, they have more reason to go for help, and they have more to lose if they don't go for help. So one of the stigma questions you always get is, will people find out? Well, what we tell callers usually is, well, if you don't go for help and it gets worse, then people for sure will find out. If you nip it in the bud when it's, the trauma is young, you have a much better chance of helping yourself and people won't find out about it. 
Now, Rabbi Yorenstein, would it be fair, you know, by the way, if I was a lawyer now, I would be thrown out of court because it's called leading the witness. Um, but I, I, would, I would like to ask you, is it fair to say that a person, the smarter a person is and the more accomplished they are, it's a little bit like the Gemara says, um, um, you know, Misha Gadol Mechavera Yitzra, but in the same thing, mental, you know, a person who's brighter, it's like, a, it's like a, you know, you have, a, you have a K car engine and you have a Ferrari engine, which is probably immensely more complicated and very few mechanics. So is it fair to say almost that the more accomplished a person is and the brighter he is and the bigger Talmud Chacham and the more um, his mind is complex and, and, and iterative and intuitive and, comp- and and therefore they would in effect, they need the gym, the mental gym even more than a sort of a, a simpleton type of a person? Tough question to answer. I, I really don't know the answer, but I could tell you that the more com- smarter they are, the more complex they are, they have more reservations of going to a therapist because since they feel they're so smart, they want to solve the problem themselves. And what we usually tell them is that if you are a very big lawyer and a partner in a major firm, you still use an accountant to do your tax return. The therapist may not be smarter than you. And the therapist maybe um, is, does not have the knowledge, let's say, in business or the knowledge and learning that you have. But he has a certain skill set that you don't have. Right. That's a good analogy to an accountant. Let me ask you, going back to something you mentioned before. So I've had a trauma, let's say. My name is David or Beryl or whatever. And it creates some type of a wound. And just like there's a wound, it's a wound in my head, it's a wound in my psych. And I can go to a therapist and I could say, you know what, it's going to go away by itself. Do, does, do mental health issues go away if we ignore them? So <clears throat> it's also a loaded question because mental health issues, it is a very wide gamut of mental health issues. But since you use the word trauma, I'm going to give you the following statistics. 85% of all the trauma phone calls we get are not acute trauma. A trauma that took place two years ago, five years ago, and sometimes 25 years ago. Very wow. few phone calls that we get are acute trauma, something that's happening today. So people are calling us at age 30, 40. We have people call us at age 55. We had very big people, I'm not going to say big and what, very accomplished people that are dealing at age 50 with trauma that took place in their teenage years. So you're saying it doesn't go away. And I will tell you, I was by the bedside of uh, Adam Gadol, whose mother died when he was uh, young. And he was a Zakin already, and he was crying, talking about how he missed his mother. Hmm. Okay. Who had died, I don't know, 80 years before that or something, 75 years. It was really very amazing how you say a trauma that wasn't discussed, a wound just sometimes just never gets better if it's not addressed. So, Rabbi Orenstein, you do 80,000 calls a year. The Rabbi Nishalom should give you a lot of kayak. Okay. And for all my listeners, I want to tell you that I consider Rabbi Orenstein to be a Lamed Vav Tzadik. He's formed both relief, renewal, and I call him up before a Shoshana for a bracha and a kvittal. I don't know. You know, the Satma Rebbe used to say you go to people with numbers. The only number I use today is the number of relief to call Rabbi Orenstein before a Shoshana. It's really a big... Covered to have you on with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rav David. If you think that I'm a Lama Dvav Tzadik, I may have to send you for help. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on. Call to bye bye. We have the honor of having with us on the phone from uh, Los Angeles, California, Rabbi Dr. David Fox, who is uh, an extremely unique and talented individual. He was a professor at USC of California. He was a professor at the School of Professional Psychology. Also, he did medical work at Loma Linda School of Medicine. He has smicha from five different uh, Rabbonim and Bezdins, including Rabbi Feinstein, Rabbi Scheinman, etc. Um, he was on the Bezdin, Rabbi Yusach Hagar, the Savran Rebbe, Nerish Yisrael. Uh, he's also 
uh, he's a forensic and clinical psychologist. He's a director of crisis and trauma and bereavement for High Lifeline. That's a lot of a lot of titles. Welcome, Rabbi Fox. Thanks. Very honored to be uh, speaking with you today. Rabbi Fox, um, a lot of people are, you know, believe, you know, go for therapy. And those who don't, many should be going for therapy. May I say, I think it's, you know, it's sort of like going to the gym. It's working out the spaghetti in a person's head. So I wanted to discuss with you some halachic, being that you're both a, a psychologist, a clinical psychologist, and a musma, five smichas. Let's talk about some her- therapy, Shilas. And let me throw one or two at you. You're the therapist, and somebody sits down and they want to talk about their mother or their father or their spouse, and they open up their mouth. And the lush and horror just comes streaming out. So first of all, is that mota both for them and for the therapist? Question one. Two. Question two, yichud with the therapist. There was a pretty terrible story here. A year or two here in New York it created, an, unfortunately, a terrible chil Hashem with a therapist in Williamsburg who was, you know, they claim he raped the girl or he did it. One thing's for sure, he was over on yichud with the girl. It took her for long trips and day trips. Is there a problem of yichud with a therapist? You're sitting in an office in Beverly Hills. There's nobody around. Um, and question number three, and I guess I'm, too many questions, but I'll, I guess we could. But I just want to give the crowd an, an overview. Confidentiality. Somebody says a woman or says I'm having an affair. Well, are you allowed to tell her husband? What happens when the halachas, the shulchan aruch, maybe conflicts with? the halachas of your professional. What do you do then? Somebody admits to you that they maybe molested somebody. Are you allowed to tell the, uh, the uh, warn people? And, uh, and after we do that, I would like to talk about a few, but this is enough to start off with. Give us a little bit of an overview. Okay. Thanks for the opportunity to address uh, these shilas. I'm just going to cite them in order <clears throat> one has to do with uh, Lashon Hora uh, within the therapeutic dialogue as it may affect both the patient and the clinician. The other <clears throat> is the issue of Yichud, and that also is a reciprocal Shiloh, such as the Lashon Hora one is, namely if this is an issue for the uh, the patient or client, then it also will be an issue for the clinician therapist. So your question's a good one, that a patient is venting and expressing their hatred, their disdain, um, their objection to some things that someone has done or is doing. Um, And in that sense, were this to be in another social setting, we would be quick to say that if they're fabricating this, they're being what they shemra, and if they are disclosing fact, then they may be uh, guilty of Lashon Hora. So what's important that the public often doesn't grasp in understanding the nature of a psychotherapy dialogue? Um, two points. First is that the therapist who's listening to the information that's being shared he or she is not serving as an aid, meaning that they don't necessarily credit the statements of the patient with abject credibility because their job as a therapist is not to be absorbing and giving credence one way or the other to what's being said. Their job is to be sifting through the issues, the psychological issues, the points of conflict, the area of uh, emotional torment and anguish, the inconsistencies in the person's thought process. But we are not there being macabre what they're saying. Um, and, and in that sense, I don't believe a competent, qualified, well-trained psychotherapist is delighting in nor having abhorrent reactions to what they're being told in therapy, they are giving this person um, a setting where they can vent, they can open up, they can disclose. Um, 
with the tachlis, with the objective of helping them past their struggle. So, so that's point number one from the standpoint of the therapist who's hearing this information. Now, just as important is the second point, and that is that when a person's engaged in psychotherapy and is disclosing or sharing or venting, generally the term that we use is catharsis, and catharsis means that being able to get things uh, proverbially off off of your chest so what you're what you're going to be doing rather than experiencing the anger or the pain or the hatred or the jealousy or whatever it is that you're venting um, by putting it into words and having a chance to listen to yourself talk you're really distancing yourself cathartically from whatever emotions are gift wrapping that information. You're, you're peeling away the emotional wrapping so that you can then take a step back with the therapist and look at what's really troubling you. So the, the objective is not to uh, influence or taint uh, the therapist. The objective is not to um, besmirch or ridicule the person who you're talking about, who most of the time the therapist doesn't know anyway, doesn't know who you're talking about. But the objective is um, to get past your, your, your conflict, your agony, your torment, your anger, your sadness, whatever it is you're feeling, so that ultimately you can then look at the incident that triggered you or you can look at the nature of the relationship that you're so hurt by, um, and you can step back and do some problem solving. So Rabbi Fox, you're saying that it's not about speaking about the other person, it's about clearing up your own issues, angers, frustrations, etc. Let's go back to our our hechitemsa, our hypothetical. So we have a person who's coming in to talk about highly delicate personal information, and they may have seldom in their lives if ever had this type of closed and close relationship with a person of the opposite gender. And so they're talking about very delicate, personal, private things. So it is very possible that they're going to have some level of confusion or distortion or experience which would certainly create some questions about the propriety of what they are doing, what the therapist is doing. So now, a couple of things. I spoke about Gedorim, and I lecture to Rabbanim and to therapists very, very often about this. Uh, I did a workshop for the uh, Dayanim and Rabbanim for the uh, CRC in Chicago, uh, last year, along with uh, Diane Reese and Diane First, and we talked about this, the Libo Gospo and the Gedorim that are incumbent upon all of us, whether therapists, whether uh, Kirib workers, whether rabbis. Okay, so what I am madrich people, and what I insist on in my practice is that, A, doors are never locked, B, that none of the staff will see a patient of the opposite gender if there are no other clinicians in the suite. Uh, Three, none of the staff will see someone of the opposite gender after hours or very early in the morning or on weekends when the building is deserted. Um, And those in situations where the best therapist for the job is of the opposite gender, so those are some essential safeguards. Um, Now, let's also understand that regardless of what the the hamon am or the media assumes therapy is about, there are many, many people who come into treatment where the issues are not going to get emotionally intense. There are so many modalities of treatment where the focus is far less on catharsis and feeling and and far more on problem solving. 
and behavioral focus. Um, and most of the post that we'll talk to will say that a behavioral or even a cognitive behavioral modality of treatment is a lot safer to work with with regards to levogospo, um, and that will even mitigate to a degree some of the yichud concern. But I am agreeing with you that the issue is there, and many of us, l'chadchila, will refer a patient of the opposite gender to a same-gender therapist. However, there are situations where someone must see a competent expert, and when that is the case, um, these gadorm are essential. Now, there's a second dimension, which also must be said, so that the public can appreciate this. And that is that a psychotherapist is professionally trained. What that means is that the therapist has gone to school. The therapist has had a lot of one-on-one -on -one supervision. Uh, the therapist ostensibly has done some personal counseling or therapy to identify areas where he or she struggles, where their conflicts are, and where that is likely to surface within their own efforts to do therapy with other people. Um, and a person has passed a series of examinations and tests so that they can practice. And then they continue post-licensure to get supervision, which means to have either peer supervision for a, a group of other clinicians to talk about some of the realities of being a from therapist and some of the halachic shilas. And on top of all that, sort of the icing on this cake that I just uh, baked for you, is that uh, every licensed, competent, supervised, well-trained professional should have a POSIC and should also be ready to have the patient identify his or her, her POSIC in the event that there are halachic considerations that can rise up in the course of treatment. Now, in, in my mind, and this is what I teach others, um, those are the Th those are the criteria for becoming a mental health professional. Unfortunately, the Daivo Nenu, in our country and other parts of the world also, we are seeing more and more people practicing psychotherapy who may or may not have legitimate degrees, um, who may or may not ever have become licensed, um, many of whom have never done a supervised internship um, and don't get ongoing supervision. All right, and for example, the, the, fellow who, the fellow who we're talking about, I understand, had no license whatsoever. It's very common in certain circles, like, you know, somebody becomes gets a reputation as a wise person and suddenly they're treating people. Right. And so this is an area that more and more... Uh, people like myself have been educating our poskim and our rabbanim and our roshi yeshiva and the heads of seminaries um, and also trying to get the word out to the public that one should not see a person who does counseling or therapy unless we know that they have earned a license which they can only earn in every state in this country if they have actually done a supervised internship um, and they have passed a series of examinations. So one should not see a person not legitimately trained. And secondly, um, a person who has got a degree but has not then taken all of the other professional steps um, should not be in practice. And a lot of us uh, in in this field have become more and more militant about this. Um, I am not I'm not suggesting that lawsuits and ethical violations only happen among those who are unlicensed, um, but within the firm community, um, there 
is a lot of uh, difficulty when we are relying on people who are not duly trained, and many of them have no real understanding of halacha either, no matter how wise they may be, they should not be practicing psychotherapy. It, it is it, You would not go <coughs> to a veterinarian if you needed to refer a relative for brain surgery, meaning animal operations are not the same as human operations. You would certainly not some, send someone for an appendectomy to a person who never finished medical school. Let's cut over now to our Rav Hagarin, Rav David Cohen, the great Pisic, on the Mechabas Forum. He's going to talk about balancing your Shemayim and OCD, which seems to be a little bit of a conflict. Let's see what he says about it. Let me say as follows. Firstly, uh, I don't think that some anxiety, which is based on mitzvahs, has no value. I think that the anxiety that a person has for mitzvahs, it depends, it has to be limited, but anxiety for mitzvahs, I think, is a positive thing. In fact, in the Pshuta Shel Mikra, in the Chukosei Telechu, so Rashi learns the Pshat Bechukai Se Teilechu is Shatiu Amelam Batayra. But what is what is Shmiris Mitzvah and what is Asiyas Mitzvah? We know Asiyas Mitzvah is to do the Mitzvah. What's Shmiras Mitzvah? And Lani is that I'm speaking now in Pshutei Shel Mikra. You find the concept of the Ige Be Mitzvahs in Chazal. Yidden are called the Ige B'mitzvahs, which means anxiety because of a mitzvah. In other words, I didn't have a minicha yet. What time is the shkia? It, it's a normal anxiety. That anxiety, I believe, is shmira sa mitzvah. When I'll have a mincha, that's a siya sa mitzvah. So I don't want to belittle the concept of the Ige B'mitzvah, which, I, which means stress. But it has to be a, a degree of stress that doesn't make a person sick. And there, unfortunately, and I, I know from top psychologists and psychiatrists that it's almost, we can call it the machla hadoyer, how many people are stressful to the extent that they need professional help. People with OCD, this, of course, mitzvahs are a tremendous outlet but you, you can't say that even though the Ige B'mitzvah stress has a positive value in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not want us to be stressed where we need professional help to get out of the situation. The, the, the Baal Shem Tev HaKadosh used to say that the greatest madrigas a person can acquire is through mikveh, even though... Uh, he, he said it's not a mitzvah. Uh, he said that uh, the simcha of a mitzvah is one of the greatest things. Actually, the Arizal says this. It's one of the greatest madregas, the simcha of a mitzvah. And on the other hand, he said that uh, that that even though uh, 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 depression, he said, is the biggest atzvus, is the biggest avera, and uh, not avera, a person can reach the shaol tachtas through depression more than he could do, doing an avera. So we have to be careful with these things. Depression can lead a person to the end of his spiritual life. I'm not speaking about the physical life. We have to be very careful of that. And if as a result of mitzvah, a person is bringing a person to this kind of anxiety where it spreads, then this is something that we have to be very careful of. It can bring a person to, as we say, to the sho'el tachtas. So there's no doubt about this. We have to have a sense of priorities. And when we approach a mitzvah, especially like Pesach, as you explain that Pesach comes with anxieties, we have to be careful to do everything in the proper priority. And what is a woman cleaning Pesach who, who, who and, and, it, and I'm sure the Rav gets a lot of calls about this, who make themselves literally sick, they go crazy? No, it's, it's wrong. It's wrong for a person to become this way, as you're describing, as a result of something which is clearly a chumrah. 
let us not belittle it. It's Yerushalmi about washing the walls, but and it has its value, and and the perspiration of baking matzis, the Mekubalim say is a is a great mechaper in itself. It's a mechaper. I believe the Arizal says that. Of course, these things have values, but if the person is not properly balanced, it could lead to terrible things. It, it, a, a depression can lead to terrible things, and or anxieties, or many things that that they could lead to even addiction. Uh, the OCD people are suffering with this illness, so a person has to be careful. The person has to judge oneself and be careful that whatever is done is done with seichel. So the person who can handle the stress, it's wonderful if that person wants to be a doyeg mimitzvah. A person who can't handle the stress, it's like, it's like weightlifting. Some people get a rupture if they lift 50 pounds. Other people can lift 300 pounds. The same thing is in the world of emotions. There are people who simply cannot handle stress. It makes them sick. These people have to be careful. I give an example that our Mekayim is hachinuch. So we teach our our girls to daven, which is wonderful. But en- enough education as what is demanded of a woman davening is not given over. That the Yikr Chiv is Shmon Esrei. There is a whole to do about mea brachas if women are mechuyev bechas hashacha, but whatever it is, there are women that because of the tremendous burden of being wives and mothers, and sometimes having to pardon the expression bring home the bacon, are women who literally have no time to daven and they don't do anything simply because they know they can't handle it. But why do they give up everything? Because they know they can't daven the way they davened when they were in school. Nobody told them that the Chafetz Chaim's Rebetzin, Allah Sholem, didn't daven. I guess she did the minimum. She was Mekayim, according to the Rambam, because of the burden that she carried. But if women would know, I really all I need is Bichas Hashach and Shmanesra, and I'm a Kayim, even if you hold that that there's a chiv of davening mid on Shmanesra like the Ramban holds, but that's really enough. So a lot of these women wouldn't give up davening because they could handle the the chiv finashim even according to the Ramban. If they would only know the halacha, they wouldn't give it up altogether. So a lot of times this this overwhelming wanting to do chumrah, where really halacha doesn't require it, brings to a minimization of asiyah samitzvahs. And unfortunately, there are those that become sick as a result of the stress. Let's go back to our interview with Rabbi Dr. Fox, where he talks about yichud with a therapist. And uh, we've had a lot of that in our community. We've had the, the scandal with... Uh, Webberman, etc. It's very relevant because many therapists are female. Many of their patients could be male. Many therapists are male. Psychologists are male. Their therapists are female. This is a very relevant halachic discussion. So, Rabbi Sachs, let me ask you a question. Do you are you ever saw We know that there's a machlekes hapaiskim between you know it's, it's prior paiskim. I think it's the machlekes the beishmul. In Hilchas uh, Yichud, in 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 Chafala for Chafbeis, and um, um, and uh, and and others, whether let's say the concept of Ishtay Babai Ishtay Misham Rasay or Baila Beir, all these literal. I think Ramosha was quite machmer. Ramosha in Igras Moshe and Evan Ezer is uh, Dalad says it literally has to be where the wife is around and the husband around, whereas the Chazenish uses sort of a blanket, and he says if his you know, by the ear, she's worried, even if it's far away and he's not close by, etc. Do you use the chazenish as a smach, as a sniff to be matir, to allow um, uh, therapy for people of the opposite gender? Or are you machma like Ramesha? Like, how do you act in, in this case? Okay. So, firstly, it's an important question. And in trying to discern the actual thinking or the shita, of a posik, um, it's not as simple as looking at Bush State. 
but we do have to look look at the figures. What I have found is um, there are a number of things that Rav Moshe, who I was also to learn with um, as a as a Talmud for a number of years, um, what I've said is what I've seen is that there there are a couple of areas where he's quoted, and he's actually misquoted with regard to his uh, attitude about some of the gedorim for psychotherapy, and certainly for hypnosis. Um, I've published two things. Uh, uh, Trying to better understand what he held, and in both cases, I asked Rav, Moshe, I asked Rav Ruvain and Rav, Rav David, his illustrious sons, to look through what I was writing. In, in both cases, they said that the way I sort of parsed or reframed what he was saying was, in fact, uh, what he held. So, just just as a as a starting point, it is important. Rabbi, Rabbi Fox, let me tell you the Ramesh I'm referring to, and. Feel free to critique my understanding, but in Evan Ezra Dalit, I think it's in Samache, he says that if it's by Labir, that if let's say the wife knows the husband won't be returning until the end of the day, in other words, he commutes to work and he doesn't re- re- return till much later. So Ramosha writes that uh, if or if the husband is not free to leave his job until late in the day, so Ramosha writes the, the wife cannot be miyachid with a, with another person even if he works in the same city. Whereas if the husband can come and go as he please and he's not bound by a work schedule, then yichud is allowed. Whereas the chazenish, and it's not in the chazenish, but it's quoted in Dvar Halacha, say for an yichud, says that the chazenish held that by labir, it's a blanket rule, and as long as she knows that the husband is in town, she's inhibited and won't engage in, in illicit relations. So there seems to be a differing opinion between these two great achreinim. Correct. And what I would say is that most of us in practice, which means those who have Yerushimayim and are adhering to the halakha and also have a professional practice, I think most of us, having spoken over the years with colleagues, uh, most of us are um, depending on the view you're attributing to the Chazonish. Uh, that has uh, become fairly... Uh, fairly much a constant in our practice, and I do think that this relying on that that, that concept of a bala of the ear, it's also predicated on what I had started to say earlier, namely that someone who has an understanding of what does and what doesn't happen in psychotherapy um, is uh, far less likely to abuse the relationship. Now, there are certain situations, of course, where the patient will come in and say, um, next week I won't be able to have the appointment because my husband will be here or will be, will be there. And if that's what, they, uh, that's what they assert to the therapist, it's not the job of the therapist to talk them out of it. It's not the job of the therapist to more ahead there it's not even the job of the therapist to say, well, why don't you have your spouse call me and I'll discuss it with him. In other words, the, the, the patient certainly has autonomy to follow the POSIC, um, who uh, to whom they have allegiance or to whom their husband uh, uh, wants them to follow. Um, there are situations where a therapist will challenge a patient about being resistant to the process or they'll explore what is the issue. Um, but, but generally, as a starting point, as I said earlier, the, uh, the patient's POSIC uh, matters in terms of how the therapy is structured and what is done. But, but in practice, I think that m- most of us are um, mitzarif this particular uh, cluster um, of both halakhic and clinical viewpoints um, that we will generally be respectful of yichud concerns and recognize that issues can arise in therapy, but a competent therapist who works within the gedorm of halacha consults with a posik, I think many times if he or she is the most competent person or is a true expert, um, we will never be 
um, dismissing the concern of Yechud or any other halachic issue, but I think that there are mahalchim bein ha'om dem ha'elum. There are ways uh, that we can work within the Gedorm of Allah. We have with us on the phone uh, from Lakewood, New Jersey, Mrs. Shoshana Ben-Alil, who is a licensed clinical social worker with an expertise in depression, anxiety, sexual trauma. Welcome, Mrs. Ben-Alil. Thank you so much for having me. So let me ask you a question. You know, this is a show about, this program this week is about mental health. And as a mental health professional, I mean, do you think it's being adequately um, addressed in our community? And let me really back up. Let me say, have you seen mental health issues in your practice that were sort of very traumatic and, and turned into horror stories that had they been addressed years before maybe could have been avoided? Absolutely. Absolutely. I will say that I'm so so glad that in the past few years we're seeing more of an education, more of an awareness, and more people coming forward to get help in a preventative way so that we don't have the horror stories that you're mentioning. So can you share with us a story that you say, this is a story that I looked at and I said, what a terrible thing. And had it been addressed, so much pain and grief and could last forever some of this um, could have been avoided. Could you share an anecdote with us? Sure. Uh, I could share a story a number of years back, of course, without any names and identifying details, but of a Kala that found uh, a bottle of pills, uh, antidepressant pills under her uh, husband's pillow. Uh, the trauma of that, uh, uh, the foundation of trust that was violated at that moment, uh, and then the work, the cleanup work that we had to do uh, in this particular marriage. Uh, and I keep thinking, you know, if there would have been an openness, if we would have been able to really deal with it uh, beforehand, how much easier this this challenge would have been. Now, do you find that um, a, a lot of the uh, fam- divorces, et cetera, are, are, or many of them are related to uh, mental health issues? You know, I, I find that when people are responsible uh, and they're coming in, uh, and they're taking care of their challenges. And I, I think mental health is a very big continuum. You know, I think you could have somebody who is very well treated and can manage their anxiety or depressive symptoms. Uh, not only that, but has a self-awareness uh, and has a toolbox coming in if they've been on the up and up. I, I don't think that that's the foundation necessarily of divorce if it's handled appropriately. I think, you know, uh, people that are not honest, that are not open, that are afraid to seek mental health, uh, a mental health professional, with, I would say, the old-fashioned notion that, you know, there's a terrible, terrible stigma that I can't do this, I think they're rocking the boat much more that way uh, than people that are taking the responsible choice and coming forward and learning to deal with their symptoms, and not only learning, but growing from them, uh, and come into marriage well prepared. We've seen victories. We've seen success, Baruch Hashem. And I know that I don't speak just for myself, but from we have in Lakewood just alone over 250 mental health professionals. Baruch now, I, Hashem. I know a physician in Lakewood who tells me that 50%, that's 50% of the medication he prescribes is uh, our medicines like Prozac and other, you know, Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think people are so shocked by that number. First of all, our our general practitioners are in the front line. They are the first ones that are prescribing much more than psychiatrists. Um, and yeah, I mean, I once had years ago a client who said, "Wow, I can't believe it. I went in for Zoloft, which is an anti-anxiety medication, and they were all sold out at the store." Yes, people are on this medication. People are doing well. They're the people that you work with. Uh, they are people that are successful in their businesses and in their lives. Uh, and I think the idea that this is something that only for the very few is also a, a myth, a real myth. Do you think that um, mental health issues in our community are, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of unusually high in our community, or are we called Prozac Nation? Is it just representative of the country at large? I think it's representative of the country at large. I think that we have much more of an, of an awareness 
now uh, about what we can do, how to be proactive. I mean, I think the statistic is one out of five people are taking some kind of psychotropic medication. Uh, you know, uh, there are many, this could be debatable. Is it because we're living in such a fast-paced society now with so many societal pressures? Or are people just more aware and are much more proactive in being able to take care of their symptoms uh, together with a, a good balance of therapy uh, and and or psychotropic medications? Uh, you would not know who these people are. They're successful, most of them highly successful, wonderful, functional people out there. Now, uh, before we go to a more an area, you know, very narrowly defined as your expertise, you know, um, uh, somebody's buying me for Yom Tif, and they said that <clears throat> they had a friend who got married, and right after the wedding, the boy decided on his own. She wasn't aware he was on medication, and he went off of medication without telling her. They went on a trip together for Pesach, the family, and he went off his medication, and it, two days in, he started acting crazy. I mean, in all, whatever mm-hmm. symptoms, and they got divorced. And it's mm-hmm. thirty five it's thirty five years later she never remarried. Oh, do you think that mm-hmm. yeah, isn't that t- it's a terrible story. This do you mm. think that is it fair to say that people who in Shaduchim um either themselves they're not honest and don't tell the person they're going out with about their issues, or alternatively a shadchen, or somebody who's called up for information and declines to identify an issue where somebody is on, you know, basically psychiatric drugs that without them could they could they would be they would be different, and um, could they be either a lesama del damriach? I mean, is it possible? Is it fair to say that the person who read the girl this shidduch and didn't disclose it, not only did she ruin this girl's life, but all the children this girl could have had were killed by this woman or man or whoever it is as well. That was my feeling when I heard the story. Would you have a similar opinion? I think that it's very important. Uh, you know, I don't think Shadchanim necessarily know when they're reading, uh, but certainly if it's a friend, if it's a Rebison or a, a teacher, we have a very, very, very uh, strong responsibility uh, to be able to share, uh, to be able to back that up with perhaps speaking with the medical doctor um, you know, I ran uh, for about a year a shidduch. I was a shotgun for people with mental health issues. Uh, it was a great school to be able to do this um, as a mental health professional, to be able to speak to people, dispel notions, but also to be very honest and clear with people. But I do want to point out that, you know, there is a very big continuum with mental health issues. You know, somebody dealing with a severe personality disorder is different, than, and, and even those people could be helped if they have to take responsibility. It's different than somebody who is struggling with anxiety who could really be well controlled with the medication. But honesty and transparency is 100% essential. And I think a lot of marriages actually do very well with people when they come in and they understand, you know, some of the potential challenges or the gifts that their spouse brings in through knowledge, or responsibility, self-awareness, um, you know, with, with, you know, taking the right measures. So now I want to ask you something. You know, the, um, the from a world as a whole, somebody who goes to a social worker or a psychologist, it's considered like a horror for Shaduchim. And the treatment of mental health is almost always covered up, as are many other things. Now, I so struggle... Can I, just, I, can I just interrupt you just for a minute? I think that that may have been the case a decade ago. Uh, There are many healthy people coming in for therapy that want to have somebody who, you know, could be objective, uh, that could help them with some of their challenges. Uh, And I'm finding a very healthy, um, you know, uh, respect for the the profession. And I don't know, I I certainly would imagine that there are some people like that, but I believe that there are many others uh, that are supportive of somebody coming in. And it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, somebody's nuts if they're coming in, but rather responsible. Uh, and, and I'm seeing a shift that I'm very, very, very happy about in our living room community. Baruch Hashem. Well, that's what I wanted to really discuss. In other words, the um, the um, the feeling seems to be by many people, if somebody if, if somebody's going to a psychologist, the family will do anything they can to keep it 
uh, as a secret. Or you say it used to be that way, maybe it's changed. Um, I, I don't know that it's changed. And the reason is how it will affect the children for Shaduchim, etc. Now, mm-hmm. now here's here's what I don't get about that. You know, when somebody physically goes to a trainer, right? In other words, the best athletes in the world go to trainers. Um, I once had a did some business with Derek Jeter, and he wherever he went, he had a trainer went with him. He says, I work out seven days a week with my trainer. Now, mm-hmm. you, you wouldn't say because somebody has a trainer, there's something wrong with them. Maybe they have a... Uh, Maybe they have some type of physical disability. This is one of the greatest athletes in the world. On the contrary, he says, since I'm one of the greatest athletes in the world, I have to be in the greatest imaginable shape, and my trainer mm-hmm. keeps me in the greatest imaginable shape. Now, mm-hmm. in, the, in the corporate world where I where I spend a lot of my time, you know, top executives are paid for their making good decisions, good judgments, not losing their cool, staying, you know, temperate under the most... Uh, extreme types of adverse situations very often, you know, having many, many direct reports. And almost, I wouldn't say most, but many of the good executives that I know have either personal uh, coaches uh, to, to, or psychologists to guide them through stress. So it's seen, as, mm-hmm. it's seen more as a badge of respect, like, okay, you're somebody who uses your brains, and therefore you can't have any noise in your bandwidth you have to have, be able to make decisions clearly, concisely. So going to a psychologist is seen as a way of clearing the noise out of your head and coming to, and, and having your faculties um, in a more, uh, uh, more crystal clear to make better decisions. Um, so why is it that in our community do we see it as a, as a scar, a community that prides itself where the people of the book, the Am HaSefer, where Talmidei HaChamim are respected, where Das is respected, where somebody who is, you know, Mavobo Badaita is not allowed to be, a, not allowed to paskin, or somebody who's drank, can't paskin, can't go up to Berchaz Kehanim, can't do Avaida. So clarity of mind is greatly respected. Why don't we see self-awareness, going to a psychologist, working out stress, working out issues with parents, with children, with job, with society, with like, it should be seen as a badge of honor. I would tell you that I don't know if I would do a shidduch with somebody who never went to a psychologist. It means they're very unaware. I think that your approach is very refreshing. I, I do think that I'm hearing your sentiments being echoed more and more within the from community. And halavai, viper, we should continue to see the respect, a healthy respect for people that want to develop a toolbox uh, many people like you uh, were mentioning are coming in because they just want to clear a little bit of the noise. They want to be able to stay razor sharp in their fields. They want to be able to focus on their family, the, the people that they love. Uh, and they're really, really just developing a, a wonderful toolbox. Uh, there's even a new notion now of psychologists that are actually helping athletes. You had mentioned Derek Jeter, helping athletes to be able to stay in their game, not just in physical trainers, but also emotional trainers. So I think the world at large has definitely caught on, and I'm happy to say, I mean, my hostel, but we are really appreciating more and more uh, the great, great advantage of being able to come in. There's, it, it, you come into a private setting, nothing is shared outside, uh, and you're able to really uh, blossom and grow and actualize your full potential and get some of that noise cleared out of your head. That is our goal, uh, and bring the nukas to so people. How do- how do we send that message out to our community that raising self-awareness, um, raising productivity, I can tell you personally, like there are times in business during this, the financial crisis of 2009 where we, uh, the world blew up and I was you know, in the office off until late at night putting out fires all day and I was uh, you know, putting in literally 18-hour days sometimes and I said, I just can't make decisions anymore. My head is flying. Somebody said, I have somebody really special who can clear the bugs out of your head. I went to them over basically a 10-month period of a crisis. And thank goodness, I was able to stay very, stay collected and calm and put my business back together again, whereas many others, you know, Lehman, Beer, um, Citibank had to be bailed out, Freddie Mac, 
Fannie mm-hmm. Mae, et cetera, but the ability to stay cool and collected um, without a mental health professional would have been exceedingly difficult. I don't know if I could have or wouldn't have done it, but the ability to work out stresses, work out issues, put things in perspective, for me was an extremely valuable um, um, set of tools that allowed me to, you know, function on a much higher level. And when will our community recognize the value of this? And obviously, I'm not trying to make a plug for your local LCSW. I have no vested interest. <laughs> but I'm talking about well, I, I, you know what? just to I raise efficiency, most, you know, just to you raise. You know what? The most compelling piece right now is you self-disclosing in such a beautiful way uh, I think, you know, people admire and respect you. And when people hear, wow, he could do it, you know what, uh, I think maybe I'll take a second look. Uh, you know, what doesn't defeat us can strengthen us. Um, and I, I think that that's what we hope to impart to our, our, our clients, uh, that they have the ability to be able to uh, succeed despite uh, ch- terrible challenges sometimes. You know, there's a book that was written, The Blessing of a Broken Heart. Uh, I think that we're able to help people to tap into the broken heart uh, and to be able to really shine, uh, and it is possible. Uh, and and that's, really, that's really the work. That really is. It is possible. It's the difference between sinking or really swimming. Uh, and it sounds like you, you are the beneficiary of a wonderful therapist, and, and I really thank you so much for sharing that to our listeners. Uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you something else. Therapy. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll tell you that... Um... You know, I I work when I say work between learning, working, et cetera, family, not usually less than you know sixteen, seventeen, eighteen hours a day, and uh, well, ca- carrying <laughs> you know, I'm carrying around anger or mm-hmm. frust- or frustration very often because I think the default position in life is that most things do not go as planned. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's true. Contrary That's contrary true. to the things we're taught. <laughs> Most things do not go as planned. You know, most uh, deals that we are interested in, we find out ultimately, you know, depending, sometimes it's a day, sometimes it's a week, sometimes a month, the faster the better. Yes. Yeah. We've got to fasten our seatbelts and go for the ride. Because yeah, you know, our our team says this, mm-hmm. for every transaction we do, that there are 99 that are rejected, and it can be very yes. aggravating, expensive, mm-hmm. frustrating. And I think the same mm-hmm. thing goes for all our relationships, parents, children, the dreams we yeah. have, most do not really work out, at least as initially planned. And carrying Absolutely. around carrying around all that anger and frustration really is exhausting. And having the ability to shed it through talking to the appropriate person and shedding it, it's the equivalent of somebody running a race carrying a knapsack full of stones or somebody running a race with, an empty knapsack on their back. And I am really at a loss to understand why people are so adverse to using such a tool which could increase their productivity, their happiness, their shed weight, shed smoking, shed addictions. I'm at a loss to understand why don't we use modern tools. I mean, we use electricity. We Many of us use the Internet. We use refrigeration. We use... Air conditioning, I always say that we, we should make a bracha, we should add to the brachas in the morning, the fellow who invented air conditioning. Why don't yes. we use the, the <laughs> mental <laughs> health, why don't we use the <laughs> mental health advances which do as much to lighten our load and to increase efficiency? Why is that seen as a stigma? Well, I'm hoping that we could dispel this, this stigma. I mean, what we really teach our clients is that they could be flexible, they could roll with the punches. They could crack open each moment. You know, we do have diamonds in our day. Uh, you know, there is a negative bias where we're constantly, the Asahara is pulling us to the negative. But imagine if we didn't have to get sucked in uh, and we could develop what I call a Teflon mind, which is, you know, a mind, you know, that lets things go in without getting stuck, uh, let it out, and be able to focus on the present. The present is the present. And the truth is, if you think about it, relief fields, how many calls? Thousands of calls a year. Uh, you know, Rebitsons and Paula teachers, the referrals that I get from communal leaders. I think the shift, Baruch Hashem, is changing. There is a healthy appreciation for uh, this work and for what people can gain from this. And I, I think it really it, it benefits so many, Baruch Hashem. And to be able to, I really think it's a Vodis I would go so far as to say that when you 
can actually make a difference in your life and your relationships and the way you handle your stressors. Uh, it, it, it totally works. It really, really, really is. It strengthens the whole family system. Everything. Well, Mrs. Benalil, thank you very much for sh- sharing your time with us. You're so very welcome. Thank you for inviting me on. 